What's up, everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Bartender. 2023 is starting off with a banger of an episode. You're going to want to gather yourself because we've got John Robertson on the program. If you don't know John, this is your lucky day. He's an author, speaker, consultant, and coach. His focus is on treating crisis in the workplace from a root cause perspective. He's the founder of Fort Log Services and is the best-selling author of Running Toward the Roar. Transform crisis and change into the opportunity to thrive. Oh yeah, and he's a hoot. John's an amazing person. His approach is different and it just flat out works. This conversation was a blast and I think you're going to dig it. So buckle up TC beers, grab your favorite cocktail, and let's get right on into it with John Robertson on today's TCB. Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender, where we gather some of the best HR and people leaders to discuss what's happening on the people side of business. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. It is Wednesday. It's your favorite day and mine. It is Corporate Bartender Day. It's the 25th of January 2023. Like most times, I admire the passage of time and I'll admire that we're almost done with January. Is that a thumbs down, Ruby, on the being done with 112th of 2023 already? It is episode number 157. We just keep racking them up. Today's going to be a fun day. We've got a special guest. We've got John Robertson on the show. John is the founder of Fort Log Services and the author of a cool book called Run Toward the Roar, Transfer Crisis and Change into the Opportunity to Thrive. John's a facilitator, coach, guide. He's inspired and driven by values. And if the conversation we had in pre-show is any indication as to what this conversation is going to be like, it's going to be a hoot. (laughs) It's going to be a hoot. Looking forward to it. Um, as I do every week, because I'm a pain in the ass, I'm going to keep asking <laughs> if you're listening to this show and you have not purchased your copy of You, Me, We, Why We All Need a Friend at Work and How to Show Up as One. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, Lori, for pointing. And I see yours, Lance, on the shelf behind you. I have them next to my droid <laughs> the behind me. You can um, tell we're super fans. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, If you haven't done that, please do. And if you do, and you're listening to this show, if you buy a book, shoot me a note, eric at skyteam.com, S-K-Y-E-T-E-A-M.com. And I will sign a book for you and send it to you so you can gift the one you purchased to somebody you like or somebody you don't. Either way, it works for me. Ruby and I are trying to get more books into the world because we believe in the power of relationships at work. And we're going to touch on that today with John. We've got some guests coming up. Uh, I think this is going to be a fun conversation. Dr. Murray Sabrin, he wrote a book called The Finance of Healthcare. And basically it's about all the problems that we have with healthcare in this country and the way it impacts employees. So he is, um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. I think that's going to be fun. We've got Randy Roberts, who's an executive coach who identifies as a hippie with an Ivy League education. So she's all about getting unstuck. We're getting working on nailing a date for her. I've got probably three others in the pipe. Of course, we've got Thais Gibson, who's coming sometime after Easter, April 5th. Is that after Easter? I don't know. Before Easter's Easter. one of those. It's one of those moving holidays. It's never the same day. So I don't know. April 5th, Thais Gibson will be here. She's going to talk to us about strengthening the relationships that you have in your life, which is directly correlated to this book that I just talked about, You, Me, We, We All Need a Friend at Work, and How to Show Up as One. All right, before we get into our conversation with John, um, I've got a news item for you. Um, And as you guys know, when we have a guest, I try to tie it to that guest's expertise. And looky, looky. Uh, John's all about crisis and management of crisis. And this article popped out at me. Are you leading through crisis or just managing the response? Um, and I, I noticed this was actually written in, in March of 2020. So right? it would be like, oh my God, <laughs> what is happening? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, it's interesting, right? Because at that moment in time, and you know, I was explaining to John in the pre-show how this community even got started, right. As a response to that, because everybody was like, Oh shit, what are we supposed to do? Um, we were struggling with managing our own response to that crisis. And that's kind of what this article talks about. It says, you know, in a crisis moment, leaders tend to focus their efforts on the tactical, on the, on the things that they can tick off the list versus leadership in general. Um, it, it preaches that the most effective leaders in crises ensure that someone else is managing the present while they're focusing their intention on leading beyond the crisis and getting us to that more promising future. Or like we used to talk about all the time, you know, when things get back to normal. <laughs> hey, John, what happened to normal? Normal died and not even on life support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, normal is gone. And I think we all struggled with that for a while because, you know, how many times did we talk about our return to office plans? Right. I think we probably did half a dozen shows on that because our plans were changing. Our clients plans were changing. People that we knew their plans were changing. Lori said normal is a town in Illinois. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Intercourse is a town in Pennsylvania. Lori, just so you know. It's spicy. And denial is the state that I find myself in very often. <laughs> so the article identified four traps that leaders fall into, and I think it's interesting to think about these traps as we think about the journey that we've been on since 2020. Number one is taking a narrow view, you know, getting sucked into the details of whatever is the, the uh, focus of the moment, um, getting seduced by managing, taking the short view. Um, this one I thought was interesting, over-centralizing the response and we saw that in some of our larger, more complex client, clients where they tried to they tried to do everything in a one flavor fits all kind of way. And it just didn't work. It's why the return to office plan changed every week. Right. It was we had the, I had one client that in the beginning of the pandemic in March, they were going to go back to work in May. Well, everybody knew that wasn't going to happen. And then May became August and then August became October and then October became January. And then we pushed all the way through 2021 and they're still not back to five days, button seat in the office because John, what happened to normal? He died. He died. <laughs> <laughs> So they're still figuring that out, right? So over-centralizing the response, I thought, was interesting. But the kicker for me was forgetting the human factor, right? When we're responding to some sort of crisis event, um, sometimes if we're getting stuck in the tactics, I think it's easy to forget that we're dealing with human beings who have thoughts, emotions, and feelings. And if we're not tapped into where our people are and how they're doing, um, we can really, we can, no matter how hard we swing, we can miss that ball. One of the things that I know Ruby and I took out of, of 2020, 2021, especially with our coaching clients, um, was check in on your people when you don't need something, just call them and ask them how they're doing versus what they did as it relates to their task list. Right. I don't know, Lori, anything you would say here about these four traps? Um, not, not about the traps, but I did like that concept of if you're, you know, kind of the, the highest level leader, make sure somebody else is managing the immediate day-to-day -day stuff so that you can be thinking beyond that and be focusing on the bigger picture and the bigger impact on people. Um, there's a, a story in there about somebody who lost 40% of their staff in the 9-11, um, terrorist mm -hmm. attack. And um, what he decided is right. We have to, we have to keep the lights on and we have to make sure our people are okay. And he said, the more he actually focused on, are the people okay? This stuff took care of itself mm -hmm. as opposed to right. Like live throw my hands up. I don't know what to do about this, but I can be tactical. That's maybe the urge is to, I can wrap my arms around this because it's, it's less overwhelming, but really the other is the more impactful. And 
one of the things you're speaking to that's actually really, really important <clears throat> is, yes, it's tactical because they can put their arms around it. But people who are stressed need a task or goal to focus right. in. On. That's just biology. But the second part that often gets forgotten in these whole conversations is who cares for the caregiver? Yeah. Oh, man. And yeah. And so what happens is it's great for Billy Bob and Susie Q to be running around looking after all their people or keep us focused on the big picture. But welcome to the human species when you get stressed. Mm -hmm. And and the big picture part of the brain, I'll engage yours right now. Don't mm -hmm. think about a pink pickup truck. Walk oh, a pink it. pickup truck out of your whatever you do, do not think about a pink pickup truck. I want <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. And it's not a standard, so you don't need both knees. And one of the things that happens is we leaders who get stressed forget that that part of the brain, the pink truck part of the brain, is not firing on all cylinders mm -hmm. and therefore. If they don't re recognize it, jeepers, I guess I'm a little human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The tactical becomes, or whatever goal, becomes the only thing to focus in on because it's the only thing my head can get its brain around or however yeah. I'm supposed to word that. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the whole... And this is not hijacking. recommended. This is not recommended for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. But when Being I get human? stressed, my what, <laughs> pardon me? Being human, not recommended for the pain of heart. No, I was gonna, I'm going to use a personal example. And my wife and I have been married 35 years. And when I get stressed, she knows. But one of the things that we were talking about earlier, Lori, you know, Lori one, not Lori two, but <laughs> is that ability to process a whole bunch of information doesn't work. Yeah. And words are just information. And I get caught, and yes, it's a birthmark, I know. <laughs> but I will say, do you have a point? Because I can't follow you. And that just never goes well. <laughs> I received well. <laughs> but, but it's a stress response that we laugh about. But it's a stress mm -hmm. response, even while I'm the person who no I can physically or cognitively walk through what's happening. But it still comes out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I love uh, yeah. all of that. Um, just if it's okay, or it just it made me yeah. think about I was coaching someone this week and it was like a kickoff for the engagement, and we we're talking about her goals. And um, and you know, I always talk about whole person, right? Like anything gets to be in this space because what happens to you at home impacts you at work, and what happens to you at work impacts you at home. And I ask, you know, what are you thinking about? What are you focusing on? And it was all about you know, her team and getting to the next level. And she was saying, I shouldn't have any space in her life, but it was all work focused. And at the end, I'm like, what are you taking away from this? And she was like, you know, I need to go back and revisit my goals and, and think about the whole person. Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about that component. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, you have wow. so much work to do. And if you don't do that part, you're, it's, it's not going to go well. It's going to hurt. It's going to be harder, you know? Yeah. And to quote Tommy Boy, it's going to leave a mark. And, <laughs> yes. And one of the things, that, so as much as this sells, sounds self, whatever, patting myself on the back, part of the premise that I wrote Run Toward the Roar about is what I call the ABCs, the attitudes, beliefs, and connections. Oh, thank you, Eric. <laughs> is And can you tell that was Photoshop? Because the, you know, anyway, sorry. <laughs> the... the the premise behind it, attitude, is the physical and emotional. And most people don't know how to deal with emotions. I mean, out of the five of us on the call, on the this meeting, whatever, conversation, how many of you have ever been trained on how to grieve, deal with loss? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most people think grief is tied to death. No, it's not. Yeah. Tied to loss. Loss, yeah. I know people who grieve the death of their vehicle more than they deal the kids being killed in Ukraine. Like, let keep it in perspective. So attitude is the physical and emotions. And the physical is simple because my attitude sucks if I'm not physically active. That's not brain surgery. <laughs> Beliefs 
are spiritual and psychological or cognitive. And the, and spiritual is not religious. <clears throat> and that's one of the biggest problems. So, for example, if Ruby is my boss and I believe she is out to get me, you know, that mindset in the workplace, I'm a spiritual person. Because my belief system, I'm looking for her to get me. Mm -hmm. And mindset or psychological or cognitive part of the be belief section is garbage in, garbage out was my grandma's expression. If I'm watching news and listening to crap, mm -hmm. what can you expect to come out? It's not going to charge the battery. Mm -hmm. And Jeez, see, you just described it, social media for the last 10 years, John. Well, and, <laughs> and, and I know of people now who are meeting with counselors who the counselors are starting to say, I'm going to check with your family and friends. And if I find out that you are social media, watching or listening to news, we are done counseling. Wow. wow. And kudos to them, long wow. overdue. And C is connections. And those are relationships and morals. Mm -hmm. And if you talk with anybody in the healthcare system, you will, and in the education system, you will see the moral wallops that they are getting because they are getting put in positions where they have to watch a patient with a child and they can't do anything to help because their bandwidth is full. Mm -hmm. In education, you know, some of the greatest teachers are not there for the paycheck. The paycheck allows them <laughs> to be there. Mm -hmm. They're there because they love getting the kid on track. And the disrespect and the badgering and bullying and all the other garbage. So what happens is, and Ruby, this is why it is so important to build that huddle, that community around us. <clears throat> are these connections, are these beliefs, are these attitudes going to charge my battery or drain them? They will not leave us neutral. Hmm. Yep. Yep. So, John, can you recap that for us real quick? ABC? Attitudes consisting of two things. So attitudes, beliefs, and connections. Attitudes mm -hmm. are physical and emotional because my attitude stinks if I'm not dealing with emotions and mm -hmm. physically active. Beliefs are spiritual and psychological or cognitive. And connections are the morals and the relationship. So, for example, as a lighthearted way, the way I illustrate a crisis is I call it a hot water teabag moment. If you ever want to find out what's important to a person or an organization, put them in hot water. What just like a tea bag, what's inside mm -hmm. always leaks out. Mm -hmm. I love it. And and so therefore, part of being a, a successful leader, number one, monkey see, you know, the rest of that cliche. Garbage out. Monkey see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Out. yeah. <laughs> and and so what happens is if I'm not modeling self-management then I will never be able to encourage you to do it. Yeah. Powerful. Well, and, I mean, I don't want to tie this to work directly, but in some ways it is a parenting model. Mm -hmm. Because if they, my kids see whatever, they see me doing X, Y, Z, then you know what? Mm -hmm. I can expect it. Guess what happens in the work? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a big deal. I cut out early. I, whatever. <laughs> hey, Mark, it's good to see somebody other than Lori. That's great. <laughs> I'm going to change Mark's name to Lori Russell. Just, yeah. just for well, and you see, I got to tell you, I got a personal bias already towards Mark because my middle name is his last name. So he's got to be a phenomenal guy. <laughs> he is a phenomenal guy. I was I was sad that he wasn't here. So thanks for thanks for coming, Mark. It's good to see you. From the better late than never category. Yeah, <laughs> we were we were just discussing today's news item. This is about crisis, and it happens to be pretty germane to John's book and his area of expertise. So why don't we just make it formal and we'll get into the conversation? I said in the beginning of the show, John's the founder and president of Fort Log Services. He's an author, he's a speaker, he's a coach. He's 
got lots of credentials that go after his name, but he doesn't flaunt them. He's a good guy. And if any indication of the pre-show is, is what we're going to be talking about here during the show show, it's going to be a good conversation. Let's give John a good TCB welcome, shall we? All right. Well, John, thanks. And you know, it's always funny when, when I get guests to comment on the news article, it's really slippery. We can slip right on into the formal <laughs> interview and I'd be like, man, I missed my opportunity to do the dance off, which <laughs> is kind of my jam. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Um, my pleasure. And Mark, excellent. just to follow up, better, <laughs> better the living late than True. otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely true way way better than the alternative so we're glad we're glad you're both here mark and vertical <laughs> appreciative of that so john when you were but a child i don't imagine that being this force of change as a cultural ambassador and a subject matter expert in the area of crisis and crisis response was what you wanted to be when you grew up how did you get to this point in your life and find yourself, find yourself here with us today as this expert. Well, as a child, I heard about you, Eric, and I always <laughs> wanted to hang out with you. So That's awesome. <clears throat> no, one of the, one of the things that I was that child that well, I haven't done that before. I haven't <laughs> done that before. So I was usually at the center of whatever you want to call it, crisis or things hitting the fan. And and so I actually went to university to be a doctor and it didn't work out. I hated the courses. But <laughs> but one of the things that's always driven me nuts is why when somebody gets a Charlie horse. Now, how many of you on this meeting, Paul, how many of you have never had, I'm asking it as a negative on purpose. How many of you have never had a physical Charlie horse? Okay, good. Remember the coach that would say stupid, like, oh, skate it off, walk it off. You're fine. It doesn't remember that garbage that why do we do the same thing to people when they get a psychological Charlie horse, an emotional Charlie horse, a relational Charlie horse? Why and do we do that? what's that? Why do we do that? Because a lot of humans as humans we are uncomfortable with uncomfortable feelings. And to go back to quote this wise woman earlier, we love to take the tactical because it gives a task or a goal so that I can feel competent when I'm swimming upstream. I'm going to be polite. <laughs> you don't have to be irreverence is encouraged here at the bar. Well, I'm, I'm trying to be something it's, you know, and, and you made a comment that I wanted to do squirrel with is <laughs> so when you were a child, okay, well, different define for me what you mean child, because <laughs> some people get older, some people grow up. That's I'm true. doing one of those. <laughs> well, yeah, one you can't stop. It's a natural progression. Well, and one. that's the one. <laughs> the, uh, the other, my wife does the. So, John, do you think when you're in your 70s, we will be able to go through this shopping mall parking lot like it's not a rally race? Nope. <laughs> and it's like. <laughs> mm. But so, since we're reflecting on your childhood, I've heard you say two things. So I have to ask the question. You said processing and you said skate it off. Where are you from, John? I'm actually in Canada. I'm in Ontario. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> and and the funny part for me is most of my Charlie horses were in football. So it it's skating it off is not <laughs> where I heard it. It was <laughs> the other one. And now keep in mind the family of origin that I grew up in was also Scottish. Oh. And for, for those of you that don't know the parenting model of Scots. It's if you're going to cry, I'll bloody well give you something to cry about. <laughs> and and what's happening in the workplace is the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a Charlie horse. Come on, walk it off. You're fine. And and what happens and the travesty is if you want to make a memory stick, attach an emotion. Oh, yeah. That's the easiest way to understand all memories. Mm -hmm. Trauma crisis attaches the emotion for us. However, there's another part. 
how you, that leader, whomever, how they handle me when I am in crisis will attach an emotion as well. Mm. I had this conversation with a woman a couple hours ago, and we were talking about this, and I said, I'll call her Joan. And I said, Joan, just curious, did you notice when you were going through that crap storm, storm that some of the people you thought would be there just mm -hmm. evaporated? Yeah. And then she started to get into the whole story. And it's and I was just kind of doing a conversation with her. And after about 10 minutes, she says the, wow, I guess I had a lot of pent up feelings around that area, didn't I? <laughs> and and what happens is instead of saying, well, you know, I think I know what your problem is. Sucks to be normal human. Mm -hmm. And if you find a cure for that, I don't want to know. <laughs> and reframe it instead of saying, you know, like, imagine the horrors of some of the shootings that go on. And are you nervous about getting on a bus or a train or well, you know what? If they're not nervous, we do have a problem. Mm. The fact that they are nervous is not the problem. Mm. And and so therefore, you know, I, I've had this conversation. There was a, let me give it as a 20 something. No, I guess he's 30 now. But anyways, head not in the game at work. Stuff was going on. <clears throat> His C-suite leader contacted the, what I call B-suite, the HR person, to say <laughs> they tried EAP, yeah, not so much connection. John, would you be willing to meet with him? Sure. But if he's looking for somebody to pat him on the back and tell him how wonderful he is, he's going to be sadly mistaken. You're not the guy. I'm. I, you know what? I'm the first one that will pat you on the back. But when it comes to that place, I will have no problems lowering the pat on the back 12 inches. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, sometimes discipline is not a, well, it is, it's a, feels like a four letter word, but discipline is not punishment. And that's part of the problem. People think they're the same thing. Mm. Discipline requires love. Punishment doesn't. Mm. And, and so when this young man and I got chatting and I said, you know what, if you want to drift along, don't whine to anybody that you didn't end up where you wanted to. Mm, it's fair. I, I said, I have never met a rowboat that ends up where it wants to go by drifting. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you want to row, I'll be the first one in your boat. If your boat has a leak, I will be the first one saying, now this is exciting. Shut up and paddle. <laughs> <laughs> and within 20 minutes... He shared with me stuff that was going on in his life. Mm. And a week later, he texted me to say, are you around for a quick call? I'm sure. And he said, I know we're not meeting till later on this week, but I wanted to call because other than my GP, you are the only person in my entire life that I have ever told that story to. Wow. Wow. And he said, I cannot begin to tell you how relieved and good I feel. Hmm. And it's like, for me, that's my drug of choice. When, hmm. when people feel encouraged, because I didn't do anything, I didn't fix anything, I didn't, it's just, you know, as my oh, grandma that's... used to say, and you know, the wisdom of older Grandma's. folks <laughs> is... John, don't ever forget, communication is 80%, 20%. Yeah. I had a client one time tell me, because I, I was one of those people that always filled the gaps, the silences. I hated the silence, so I would add more value with my mouth. And he <laughs> said, Spencer, you got two ears and one mouth. You should use them in that proportion. <laughs> Get out of here. Um. <laughs> So, John, you you talk about you talk about crisis. You know, we 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 in the pre-show we were talking about COVID, and, and you mentioned shootings, and you know there are all these sort of moments of crisis. But in your world, you say the event is never the real crisis. What does that yeah. mean? So, for example, just this is completely inappropriate. So, yes. judge me. <laughs> but 
you know, one of the things I was involved, it was an airplane crash, but one of the people they sent to do the intervention was traumatized because the wild animals were going after the fresh meat on the Ooh. plane that crashed. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, being an urban dweller, wild animals, raccoon, squirrel, kind of in that ethos, porcupine maybe. Well, this plane crash was across a big area. Wild animals are wild animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're doing their what, thing. And they're doing their thing. And and one of the things that always happens is we judge people by what we think is normal. Mm -hmm. So, for example, all of our kids did mission trips because we wanted them to learn that where we live is not the real world. <laughs> okay. So, you know, our daughter was my wife says she has four kids, but together we have three. So our <laughs> our eldest is a daughter. She did a trip to I don't remember if it was El Salvador or Peru, but anyways, so the rotary was doing the project back and forth and they stopped in the market to say, would you guys like some pork chops? Oh, that'd be great. We'll barbecue them all. Do you know where pork chops are kept in El Salvador? On the pig? Inside pigs. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I know the gene and it's not her mom, but <laughs> half the kids couldn't eat the pork chops. And Amanda does the, well, where did you guys think they came from? <laughs> and it was like, Amanda, how'd that go for you? Holy geez, did they ever get upset with me? And it's like, do you think? <laughs> and, and so I'm joking, but pork chops, job loss. Uh, another thing that HR is now getting caught with, especially in that B suite, how do you give a performance review, career development, feedback, whatever you want to call that, to somebody who got a, a ribbon for showing up, who's deaf and never got an F for anything? And, you know, and sometimes the fridge is full, they don't have rent or mortgage, and they're still living at home. Mm -hmm. and and so therefore how we handle the the crisis is directly proportional to who it is best example of this is a friend of mine is brahma caste hindu and his family are all from india he seeing dead bodies not yeah so <laughs> just a tuesday just a, yeah and and so therefore one of the biggest biggest issues is what is your definition of how it's impacting you not mine mm -hmm. and yeah I, I think that's such a salient point you know I've, I've worked in HR my whole career and a lot of it in employee relations and learning and development and 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 either coaching leaders on how to have these conversations with employees or coaching employees directly uh, much better for them to articulate what do you think is getting in your way or what, mm -hmm. you know, what's the impact on you of what's going on? Cause I might see it as sometimes this is not a big deal and you do need to just suck it up. Right. But that's Skate not, it off. that's not, right. That's not helpful nope. <laughs> in that moment. So nope. it's, it's really more about what are they sitting with and, and creating space for them to articulate that so that then you can modify your delivery or your suggestions or yeah. Sometimes and, it is a reality check though. Well, and, and sometimes we do have to say, you know, like this might be a time you want to take it on the chin and keep going. Right. right but, right. but you also made a comment. So a nugget for the listeners. Key of building trust is asking questions to which we don't have answers. Mm -hmm. interesting uncomfortable it's, place for a lot of people especially mm -hmm. when we love to fix everybody else yeah yeah you know john we were we were talking in the pre-show and we teased it during the news when i asked you what happened to the past um you talked about crisis and the sort of recovery period how that relates on an xy graph you just had to go there, didn't you? I'm going to prove to people I am useless at high school math. <laughs> so if you remember your XY graph, 
And I think this one's Y, y. and this one's X, right? You got it. Okay. Yep. So if it's a quick incident, the intervention support can be immediate. The longer the event goes on, Mm. the further out the intervention because people cope we adapt humans are naturally resilient and so what happens is if i interrupt your natural way you keep your head in the game when it's hitting the fan i can actually do you harm mm. because basically once you get your game face off you're never going to get back in the game that a can of worms has been opened, you're not getting back in the game. And so what's happening is people are thinking, well, COVID's over, we should be back. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Two plus years, I was head in the game, just like you guys were saying, you know, we were meeting three times a week, game, uh, return to work and work from home and all the, always adapting just to keep your head in the game. Now that we're trying to find our way in a foggy time, that intervention is going to be further out because people are going to start realizing my coping that worked here isn't going to work yeah. here. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, right? We, we've we kind of teased that normal died in 2019. Um, if you think about that sort of X, Y yeah. model, where do we end up when, when it's over, is it ever over? It, it It is, but the key is it's not a static over. It's a dynamic over. Mm. And the key is to define a refinable new norm. Mm -hmm. So as we grow forward, we, okay, this worked to get us here. Now what do we do to grow to the next level? If you want me to switch, switch to parenting, how I parent an infant toddler versus child versus adolescent versus young adult. It's still parenting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, if you treat a 20 something like a <laughs> child, yeah, you're going to get a reaction. It's not going to work out well for you. Well, it's interesting too. I mean, I love that, that parallel to the parenting model because when we embark upon that journey as parents, we know those stages are going to happen and we know then our approach is going to have to change. Okay, I would correct you on that. And I know you're the host and this is probably a career limiting move. However, <laughs> the principle behind it is true. The problem is most people don't know it. <laughs> well, I thought about that, right? But I thought about it in a very specific context, right? I thought about it in just parenting. My construct of what normal was at work was, you know, you got a job, you got up in the morning, you got dressed, you drove there, you stayed there for eight hours, you came home. And and that was a static point of view. Yep. Yep. Until COVID. And now that's that's a dynamic point of view because it's different for everybody. And I wonder, right? So is there going to be a more unified expectation or do we live in this sort of perpetual, it's kind of like this here and it's kind of like this over here? Well, and I think it's also, and, and you said this, John, kind of that each, each person's experience is different in terms of what was traumatic about it. Maybe my work was disrupted, but I didn't lose anybody to the disease or yeah. I don't have any underlying conditions. So I feel safe being in public. And yeah. so if those, right, I'm not in grief that I haven't processed, or I'm not still in a personal safety crisis. Mm -hmm. Mine was more, I got used to working at home and now it's hard for me to go to the office. Right. So, so my perspective on that might look wildly different than <clears throat> someone on my team who is very much not in the same place I'm in. And uh, Lori, I will add to it because I'm not going to ask about the people at home while you were working at home. However, how many people do we know? I know, and that's I wasn't trying to completely throw anybody under the bus, but definitely allude to the bus coming. Yeah. But one of the things that happens, how many of us know of people who weren't in a good place at home or weren't in a good place at work? 
Mm-hmm. And now all of that tea bag air, hot water effect mm-hmm. has forever walloped. You know, COVID casualty is the term that gets thrown around. And I'm not talking fatal. I'm right. talking relationships consequence. and yeah. Yeah. consequence. Mm-hmm. And and one of the things that happens is, and I'm I'm excited to see where it grows because if we commit to define a refinable new norm, one of the first things that organizations and leaders can do is what does success mean for us here? Mm-hmm. And Eric, that goes directly to your comment. Does success mean everybody's in their cubicle X mm-hmm. number of hours a day? Right. And and Ruby, we were chatting about, or I should say, Lori three. <laughs> Everybody's Lori now, John. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and wow, you guys are really see. This is one of these crises, and I'm going to have to go for a sport up. But <laughs> one of the things that happens is work life balance is an illusion mm-hmm. because the the minute I think work life balance is attainable. I give up control. Defining a refinable new norm, managing my ABCs, work-life balance is something I decide. And go to your comment, Eric. It's something I decide driving into work. It's something I decide at work. It's something I decide, whatever, driving home to pick up the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) it's... It's it's been interesting just watching different organizations and individuals in those organizations wrestle with that mm-hmm. that idea. I mean, I think there was a there was a substantial proportion of the work population that, especially in the beginning, they were just waiting it out because it was going to go back to normal and everything was going to be fine. Yep. And then when they realized that normal wasn't ever coming back, at least the way we knew it for the majority of our professional lives, Mm -hmm. which for old people like me, that's a long time, right? The people that onboarded in 2020, 2021, and 2022, they're having a vastly different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Or the, or the kids that spent their last two years of high school virtually or the last two years of college virtually. And they had to figure out how to do that socially, emotionally, physically, they have vastly and, different expectations. And Lori, one of the things that's coming out in so many different places, and you're bang on, is, uh, and I don't want you to call them maybe a rite of passage, but the frosh week of college. Mm. You know, just all the forms of stupid that all of us, well, I shouldn't <laughs> say all of us, most of us do <laughs> in the first, <laughs> yeah, I kind of wrote that book. So yeah. it, Lori did not. I did. I made up for her lack of. <laughs> Bad well, decisions. it's all about balance or work <laughs> blending, but one of the but one of the things that we have to start doing is like, for example, how many of us I, I agree with you, by the way. Um, Lori Russell is <laughs> do you see they've all changed their name? <laughs> yes, no, I saw that. And and it's like, wow, you know. Anyways, a wonder if RTO will be a visible reason to mask the underlying issues. Bad cultures, employee don't meet expectations. Absolutely. Because it ties back to the conversations. Mm -hmm. If I don't know how to have a conversation with you Mm -hmm. instead of a conversation at you or to you. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about defining that refinable new norm. Most people don't know where the term success even comes from. And Eric, you and I were chatting pre-call about etymology. And do you guys know as useless trivia, this is the stuff that I retain (laughs) as forever. But do you know where the term success comes from? Where does it come from? Thank you for that question. And and success comes from the Latin succidier. And that, and I'm not a linguistic person. What does that person. mean, John? <laughs> Good question. Thank you. And it means to come after or come under. So mm. therefore, successive integers, successor mm. to the throne. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if we are going to be a success story, what are we coming under? Mm. Mm-hmm. 
And if I don't define that for me, I am forever chasing a feather in a windstorm because the world's definition of success is true today, change exactly. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Huh. That's so good. So so I have a question. And sometimes I get into the poor me, tiniest violin on the planet mode. That's already been covered on this call with knee injuries, but go ahead. <laughs> He's funny, John Robertson. <laughs> He's got some jokes. But, you know, I'm I'm part of a senior leadership team and it's not a huge organization. And, and in some ways that makes it a little bit harder because you literally know everybody and almost uh, most of them, you know, their stories and their, you know, yeah. the, which, which I love about that. And I also struggle sometimes when, when you're trying to impact a culture or you're trying to have an organization that embodies core values and and you're you're trying to make a workplace that's inclusive and engaging and right i mean and that's truly the intention in the heart and then you have individuals who have never been a pos- in a position of trying to impact an organization in that way they only are impacted by <laughs> an organization and so i i feel like they're you know, they kind of have blinders to the whole picture of what's going on. And then their nitpicky complaints or their, I don't know why you're doing it this way. That's stupid. Or it should be like this because that's the way I like it. And, and I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to navigate that to, well, if you were in charge of anything ever in your life, you would know this is hard. <laughs> and so, it's, <laughs> you know, and I, and I try to, remember, you know, their perspective and that's not their fault or whatever, but, but how do we, how do we help people maybe see a bigger picture or help them help themselves? Cause we, so, we have these conversations about your engagement is largely about your own accountability for participating mm-hmm. and making things awesome. There are toxic cultures that you should run away from, but there's also opportunity for you to be part of how you increase your engagement. So a couple little things, best fight words in the English vocabulary, second to none, you always and never yeah. there are no better fight words. So uh, whenever we are, language, well, and I mean, look at where couples blow a gasket. You never take out the garbage. That's not true. I, I took, took it, it out last January. week. You did not. <laughs> and now we're fighting about last January. And the real issue is take the stupid garbage out. Mm-hmm. So one of the things when we're giving feedback to those people, Avoid those words. Mm-hmm. Your and I'm not trying to be sacrilegious, but your eleventh commandment is thou shalt not use those words. Yeah. <laughs> and secondly, most people's values are posted on a website. Mm-hmm. They're not actually defined mm-hmm. and described. Mm-hmm. And until the values, because this is where I start with organizations, because that's what's going to leak out in hot water. Yep. If they are not defined and described, then I cannot play my ask questions to which I don't have answers. So, for example, Lori, I saw you communicating, and it can be any Lori on the call. Lori, I saw you (laughs) communicating with that person. Can you help me to understand how I see this value in that conversation? I I don't want to judge you. I don't want to misinterpret it. Can you help me to understand what I'm missing? Yeah. And and that most people will do that on the fly. Mm -hmm. That's the worst time. That's called sandbagging. That's Mm -hmm. the worst time to do it. Do a follow up. Add it to that. Ask them again uh, when there's conversational time. How do you want people to describe you Mm non-physically? Non-physically. And that's key. Yeah, I like that. And that's a, that's a challenge. And absolutely seek to understand before being understood. And and one of the things that happens is, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and silence can be misinterpreted as a vacuum. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we're not allowing people to think, by the way, none of us are getting out of this alive. I don't want to traumatize any of you on this call, but none of us are getting out of this alive. You want to know where that question, how do people describe us non-physically shows up? Yeah. In our, you know, wake. yeah. In our- <laughs> yeah. I was at a funeral and there were six of us there and they were talking about what a great member of society this person was, how he was this, and every ounce of me wanted to do the 
okay, what am I missing? <laughs> There's six of us here and five of you are here for the will. What am I missing that this is such a great person? Mm -hmm. And having those hard conversations, for example, most people don't stop and think about the term evaluate. How do we evaluate when I don't know what your values are as a person, how you want to be defined, described non-physically, and how to describe our organizational values mm -hmm. in behavior? How do we evaluate? And so, Lori, that's what I'm pointing to is mm -hmm. having those questions, conversations, asking questions to which we don't have answers and say, I don't want to judge you. I don't want to misinterpret you. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm seeing. Help me to understand. And as a heads up to your listeners, if you are too arrogant to ask questions that you do not know answers to, go find somebody else who can ask it because mm -hmm. you will do more harm than good. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to give you an amen on that one. <laughs> that's, we need that right there. Well, that's, you know, and, and that, you know, we, we have defined our core values and the behaviors that go with them. And they are in our performance evaluation process for all the reasons that you're saying. And so it's, you know, kind of hearkening back to um, j just resurfacing those and, and reminding or, or asking those questions of how, how is this reflected in what's going on for you? And, and Lori, I really, really want to remind people to please play the stupid card. Because yeah. if I come in thinking <laughs> yeah. I know what you're doing, yeah. my question will sound, yeah. by the way, this all ties to DEI stuff, uh, diversity, equity, mm -hmm. inclusion. Mm -hmm. Because when people feel safe, I can ask those hard questions. I was doing some training at one group and, I, and they said, well, how do you deal with the differences between people? I said, simple. There's four differences between people. A, B, A, B, and O. The rest is packaging. Blood types, baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I love it. We're getting up close to time here. I want to um, give everybody an opportunity. Any more questions for John? I could talk to John for the next hour. This has been super mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. If there are no questions, go buy his book, Run Toward the Roar transform crisis and change into the opportunity to thrive. I didn't even get to ask my question about why EAPs don't work. So we're going to have to do a part two at some point, John, because we've uh, all dealt with I'd love to do a EAPs. part two with you guys, because these are the conversations that get people thinking about their thinking. And mm -hmm. when I do keynotes or workshops, whatever, that's my goal. Right? I am not interested. You guys are adults. I'm not interested in telling you what to think let's be honest and think about our thinking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because as one Lori pointed out, he is very <laughs> good at the stupid card. <laughs> so John, if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? Where do they find your book? Where do we get all of the John Robertson things? So simplest way is Amazon's the book. So okay. whatever U S or Canada, whatever people are listening to and the, the simplest way is just email me, John at Fort Log, Fort, safe place in the frontier. You got to know where you're going. And a log is a journal to sail the seas because there's no point going there alone. Nice. Co, because I work with people, colleague, collaborate, coach, not a dot com and not a whatever other thing. It's dot co. Okay. And the other way is fortlog.co is the uh, web page, obviously. Awesome. John, thanks for being with us here today. Big ups, big ups for John. This has been a super fun conversation. John, you're welcome, to, you're welcome to hang out as we do our funny things, good feels, and silly, silly cocktail and go to dinner because we are now one minute over. It's my fault. All right, funny thing number one today. Um, why do people only ever monger fear or fish? There's fear mongers, there's fish mongers. There's not a whole lot of other mongers. Chicken monger. Right? <laughs> cat, cat monger. I don't know. Uh, Funny thing number two, this is the single most pathetic moment of my entire life. <laughs> you were the number one buyer of paprika. <laughs> it wasn't even smoked paprika. Right? It's just regular yeah. 
paprika. Oh boy. <laughs> Funny thing number three, me grabs another coffee. Stomach, stop. Heart, stop. Brain, fuck yeah, five more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This this funny thing is for people of a certain age, which I think most of us on this call qualify for. When I worked at Blockbuster, a guy <laughs> handed me a note and said, I'm looking for this. The note, quote, leprechaun. <laughs> Ruby's laughing because oh. it's one of Rick's favorite movies. Ruby, what movie is that? Uh, the Leprechaun. <laughs> a series of... There are like four or five. Do not watch any of them. They're terrible. <laughs> so today I was looking at a girl because she had a piece of lettuce in her hair and she looks at me and said, I have a boyfriend. Okay, lettuce head. <laughs> <laughs> what idiot named them jet skis instead of boater cycles? <laughs> and my favorite funny thing today is from David Crosby, who we lost last week. He said, I heard this place is overrated. And somebody had Googled, can we go to heaven with tattoos? And the top response was people with tattoos will not go to heaven. People who drink alcohol will not go to heaven. People who eat too much pork will also not go to heaven. Short people will not go to heaven. And the response was the deepest <laughs> circle of hell is reserved for tattooed bacon loving alcoholic midgets. <laughs> But and it also kind of speaks, it also kind of speaks to the theme of stairway to heaven, highway. <laughs> right. All about right. volumes, traffic volumes. <laughs> All right. Steve Hartman is going to make you cry today. This is a biggie. Enjoy, my friends. Finally, tonight, a lesson in never giving up, even when it seems the odds are stacked against you. Need proof? CBS's Steve Hartman found it on the road. Technically, 13-year-old Josiah Johnson of Louisville, Kentucky, has a disability. Hi, Zaire. But almost no one sees it because Josiah doesn't see it. Although born without legs, the kid has yet to find his kryptonite. Always did everything the other kids did. But that invincibility was put to the test last fall when Josiah decided to try out for the one sport where altitude is everything the Moore Middle School basketball team. At this point, you may be wondering, why didn't he just join a wheelchair basketball team? It would certainly be a lot easier. Well, Josiah says, exactly. It was easy, it was too easy. He wanted more of a challenge. Yeah. The gumption it takes to be able to say, I'm gonna go out and do that. Who has that kind of confidence? Me. <laughs> <laughs> but as Mother Whitney says, it's not just confidence. It's stubbornness. Josiah is very competitive, and if he feels like something is too easy, he's not going to do it. Still, Josiah knew making a team was a long shot. Fortunately, though, Josiah turned out to be pretty good at long shots. He made the team on his merits. And over the last few months has become a real contributor, getting offensive rebounds assists and because of his unique position on the floor he has caused more than a few turnovers he started taking the ball from people he took the ball from me i was mad you would have thought steph curry was in the gym <laughs> but his teammates say his best play was a couple weeks ago it was just a moment that i'm gonna remember for like ever it was the end of the game seconds remaining josiah shoots from three and again his disability disappeared. What do you want people to take away from this? To do something that they thought they couldn't do. Josiah Johnson, inspiration and proof that all you need to stand above is confidence. Steve Hartman. Right? In Louisville, Kentucky. So good. I love me some Steve Hartman, as you guys know. Awesome. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. So today's, cool. uh, today's semi quarantine cocktail is ho, 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 run this DNA, please. This is a riff on the DNA number one cocktail. You're going to need an ounce and a half of gin, one girl from Rhode Island, three quarters of an ounce of apricot brandy, one request, which you'll see here on the yellow paper of the police in her hometown. 
of Cumberland. She sent them partially eaten cookies and carrot sticks. And she said, dear Cumberland police department, I took a sample of a cookie and carrots that I left for Santa and the reindeer on Christmas Eve. And I was wondering if you could take a sample of the DNA and see if Santa's real. <laughs> You're going to need a little, a little lemon juice. The cops reported that there was something magical at play here. A little simple syrup. Zero complete DNA matches, but they did reference a partial match to a 1947 case centered around 34th Street in New York City. <laughs> Two dashes of Angostura bitters. Um, they did report a close match for Rangifer Tarandus or reindeer on the carrots <laughs> and orange for garnish. The PD said they were going to need more DNA from other known Santa encounters to make a definitive match. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty great. Restored my faith in humanity a little bit. I'm grateful uh, for you. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for John for being here today. Thank yeah. you guys for hanging out. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Go get some dinner. Thanks, Thank guys. Y'all. Thanks, Lori, 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 Lori. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again. And remember, you've always got friends at the Corporate Bartender.